بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم نحمد و نسلی و نسلم علی رسول الکریم اما بعد فاعود باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ومن يتوكل على الله فهو حسبه وقال تعالى يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون وقال تعالى يا ايها الذين امنوا توبوا الى الله توبه نصوحا صدق الله العظيم All praise be to Allah, glory be to Him, blessed is His name and high is His majesty. There is none worthy of worship besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has no partner, to Him belongs the kingdom of the heavens and the earth. He gives life and causes death, in His hand is all good. And he has power over everything. Respected listeners, in light of the current crisis with the coronavirus pandemic and with the many masadids closing up and down the country, there has been a high level of unrest, panic, worry and anxiety from the Ummah and from every Muslim community. I have been getting mixed views and opinions from the ulama, from the public and the awam with regards to how as a Muslim community, we should be tackling this crisis. What steps should we should be taking in order to prevent this virus from spreading and reduce the risk and save lives. There have also been a difference of opinion with regards to the closure of the masjid. In some places the masajid are closed, in other places the masajids are open. And it compelled me to arrange this talk in order to clarify the situation, especially with regards to Masjid Umar Shafiel and the people connected to the masjid. I also have with me Dr. Mahbub Rahman Chaudhary who also happens to be my cousin brother and he works at Leeds Infirmary Hospital. Dr. Mahmoud Chaudhary Hafidahullah has been at the forefront of this crisis dealing with patients who have been inflicted by this coronavirus or have some kind of symptoms with regards to this virus. And the reason why I've invited Dr. Mahmoud Rahman Chaudhary is for him to share with us his own first and experience, to share with us his personal and his medical expertise with regards to this virus and the current situation with regards to this virus. So first and foremost, I will request Dr. Mahbub Rahman Chaudhary to share with us some important words of advice, hopefully some reassurance, and bring us up to speed as to the impact this coronavirus is having on the whole Ummah. Assalamu alaikum wa أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم شهد الله لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله I testify that there is no Lord but Allah سبحانه وتعالى and Muhammad Muhammad peace be upon him is his final messenger 
I thank uh, my cousin, uh, Maulana Jalaluddin, who has given me the honor to speak to, to you today. Um, unfortunately, I meet him in grave circumstances. And the purpose of me here today is to um, talk about what's going on. Um, by virtue of definition, by listening to this radio, uh, this radio broadcast, you're probably one step ahead. And um, the purpose of, of this um, talk is for you to inform other listeners, family, friends, that we are in a very, very difficult situation. I've, I think this talk was supposed to go out after Maghrib Salah, but uh, I've just come back from work. And I, we have been dealing with coronavirus, COVID-19, SARS, CoV-2, however you want to put it. There is a pandemic, a global pandemic, and I hope to uh, give you some advice uh, to keep you safe, to keep your family safe, to keep the community safe, um, and to keep your loved ones who are all over the country, I presume, and abroad safe. It's a, it's a worrying and, most importantly, a testing time uh, for, for us all. And I hope um, after this that uh, you're more informed and that you can take steps to uh, help others. Um, currently, the number of cases that have been reported is approximately 233. And this is the number of confirmed cases. And I wish to add that the, this number of cases is, is, the only, is only the number that have been tested in terms of deaths. Um, people are dying every day. Thousands of people die in this country every day. Not everyone's getting tested for coronavirus. So a lot of people can be dying and not being tested. So I would take the numbers that you read and see in front of you, on your phone, on your tablet, on the TV, with a bit of scepticism. Um, clinics are closed. People are, doctors are doing clinics over video over Skype, over telephone. Lots of people who are uh, cancer patients have been told that it's too risky for them to, it's too risky for them to have cancer treatment, i.e. chemotherapy. I have friends whose family members have had their cancer surgery cancelled. The health service is taking this very, very seriously. And I very much hope you are too. And like I said in the beginning, by listening to this, you're probably a sensible person. I'll tell you a bit about myself. I trained in London. I work in Leeds and also down in the southeast. Um, and I am um, learning as much about this as you are, uh, but obviously we still have to treat patients that come with all sorts of things. Um, so the tummy pains, the leg pain, the head pain, all of that's still going on in light of this uh, global pandemic. A lot of uh, what uh, I hear in the news is the word unprecedented. This is an unprecedented crisis. Uh, plagues like this have happened in the past. The last well-known pandemic was the Spanish flu in 1918, which decimated a lot of the world's population. Now, you're probably listening to this thinking, how can I... I just want to live. 
I want to, I want to fight through this pandemic. I want all of my loved ones to survive. And I'm telling you, I'm in the same position as you. The, the sole reason I've got into contact with my cousin was to check my family's well-being, to see how he was doing, to see how my uncle and my auntie were doing. Uh, and, uh, you know, in, in this time of adversity, if we, our, our true characters will show. And inshallah, everything I say, I hope, uh, God forgives me if I, uh, if I make any mistakes, and I also hope uh, I don't misinform you. But the, the reality is upon us. Uh, I, as I trained in London, I still have lots of links down in London. I was in London uh, all of uh, 48 hours ago. And um, I've noticed two things. The general public and what's going on with healthcare professionals. The general public... They've just announced that they're, you know, closing down um, establishments where people congregate, such as gyms, theatres, etc. That are closing down um, as a result of this virus outbreak. People haven't been taking it seriously. People think I'm young. Um, to be honest, I don't really have any other conditions. You know, I get ill once a, once a year, probably get the flu. Um, but I think I'll be okay with this. Two, two days ago, a 21-year-old girl died in the southeast. She was fit and well. And when I left, um, all of two days ago, left, I left... Uh, um, knowing a 31 year old who was also fit and well was in the intensive care unit I've also been told by colleagues that patients who are elderly who are in the nursing home where people don't really visit them pretty much socially isolated have come and have unexpectedly tested positive. No one is immune to contracting this. Now there are two main strategies people are employing. One is how to protect everybody else and the second one is how to protect oneself. Now the, the advice is pretty clear. If you, if you haven't received that, I don't know what planet you're living on. Um, it's to stay away from people. Stay away, stay at home. Now, what happened in Italy, and this is an evolving crisis. Every day we are learning new things how the quarantine that wasn't abided by by the Italian citizens has led to an enormous number of deaths due to this virus Germany on the other hand I've spoke to my colleague who I worked with in this country yesterday and he said, it's on complete lockdown. And uh, as is everything German, they seem to do well in everything, even though, even in terms of reducing their number of deaths. But this is, the story is not over yet. This is as of today, the 21st of March. We've got the same number of deaths in the UK as, as Italy two weeks ago. And you don't need to be a scientist. You don't need to have a degree to, to, to say to yourself, look, we're having the same number of, or similar number of cases 
as Italy, and we're two weeks behind. And people aren't taking things seriously. What's going to happen in two weeks? All I can say is watch this space. Stay at home and watch this space. My brother has on numerous occasions told the local community politely that this is a virus that's getting out of hand and I'm sure in the coming days that he will be giving similar advice. The reason I'm here is to get blessings, to get reward, to be rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the only reason I'm here. So I, if I save one life because of this, my work, my, I, my work will be done. Just one life, that's all I care about. If I can make one little change in people's behaviour that will result in someone not doing something, that will result in them probably having a reduced dose of the virus, a reduced risk, or they go and tell someone and protect someone. That's why I'm here. And lots of journal articles from respected medical journals uh, are saying that the more of the virus that you have, the less likely you are it's going to do better. So if you get a big dose, you, you may die. And that's why health professionals, doctors, nurses, are dying at the front line. In Italy, it's well reported. Doctors in their 50s, in China, doctors in their 40s, who you would presume would be fit and well, are falling, dying. It is not a movie. It is not a game, it's something that is real, very, very much real. And I'll tell you what happened to me all of six hours ago. Um, had a patient who was involved in uh, some surgery, who had the surgery and was due to go home and uh, had transport booked in order to get them to their destination and they spiked a fever so you know we deal with this all the time people spike fevers all the time people have high temperatures all the time it's nothing to worry about so I said to the nurse I said look I will why don't we just repeat the temperature in half an hour in the hope, and in my mind I'm thinking, God, please, Allah, let it not be coronavirus, COVID-19, as we say. And his temperature half an hour later was higher. His blood pressure drops, he's warm, and... Um, he's not making sense because he's got mental health problems. So you, I've had a patient who's got mental health problems and I'm thinking, you know, if I don't go in properly with the... And you might hear this abbreviation, PPE, Personal Protective Equipment. All it means is uh, some wearing the proper protective gear before going to see a patient, which involves a mask, gloves, and an apron. Or in serious cases, a gown. If I don't wear this properly, and this patient of mine 
coughs in my face. He, you know, spits on me. I don't know what he's going to do. He's, he's unpredictable. How he's going to react when I go in there. And I have, and I'm not here to, you know, blow my own trumpet or anything. I'm risking my life. I can tell you that I've got better things to do than go to work. I, I, I don't think anybody wants to be there. But we've all sworn an oath. You know, we are doing, like my cousin here, doing a job. We are doing it for, to get the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the end of the day. That is the fundamental reason. It doesn't pay anything. I can get more money earning other, uh, doing other jobs. And it was difficult to deal with this patient. And as you probably very, very well know, that they don't have enough tests. They're not testing healthcare professionals who are not exhibiting symptoms, who are not showing symptoms. Now, that's the kind of thing that I'm, I'm going through and spent several hours with this one chap. And I spoke to my team afterwards and said, look, how, how do you think we did? That's only one patient on one ward. People are scared to go in. People are shaking. And the people who aren't scared, are they taking it seriously enough? So we said to, we had a chat about this and said, you know, what, what could we have done better? Because we know the calm, this is the calm before the storm. Inshallah it doesn't, Inshallah they find a miracle and uh, this doesn't happen but I'm sorry to say this from what I can see, what I've read, the next 10 to 2 weeks will be the thick of it and it's very very important that you as a listener stay calm you stay calm for your family and you seek advice you seek help and I'm not here to preach I'll leave that to my cousin but I am not going to shy away from saying I am a Muslim and I seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and at this difficult time the only way that I'm continuing is, is in dealing and turning towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What practical steps can you take? What, 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 let's talk about the virus. The virus can spread through touch. There are reports that it can spread uh, through droplets so uh, my very good friend is a dentist he stopped working because he's dealing with people's mouths all the time uh, we all know this it can spread through touch being close to someone now let me give you some facts when someone sneezes the speed of the sneeze is approximately 1500 miles an hour let's put that into perspective 30 miles an hour you're driving on the road so 1500 miles an hour so please cover your cover your mouth there's a uh, there's a mantra that the NHS are putting out catch it kill it bin it okay so you catch it bin it that will end up killing it a virus cannot survive if it doesn't have a host a virus 
will die if it doesn't have a host. A host is a human being in this case. So if you have the virus and you don't give it to anybody else, the virus will die. And this is the reason why it's spreading like wildfire. Because people are touching each other, the virus is, let's put it in inverted commas, jumping from one person or one host to another. People aren't taking this seriously. People are panic buying. I'm not going to address that because I think today in the news that's all they've been talking about. But you don't need to be a brain surgeon to know that if you go to the supermarket, you're going to have to get a trolley. You're going to have to touch that trolley. You're going to have to touch the goods that have been touched by someone else or probably 10, 20 people. You're going to have to pay. You're going to have to have an exchange with the cashier. So if you have means of online shopping, that would probably be advisable. And in terms of uh, shopping, please don't focus on that. I'm sure uh, there will be enough food. I don't want to speak too soon. But that sh should not be our primary focus at, the, at this time. The human body can live without food for up to 35 to 40 days. The human body can also survive without water for over a week. So... I'm not saying to stop eating and to stop drinking. And I'm not here to promote a balanced diet. Okay? This is survival. It's do or die. Everybody's in survival mode. So do enough to survive. As the blessed month of Ramadan is coming, sometimes we eat once a day. Sometimes when it's not Ramadan, we eat once a day. We forget to have breakfast. We're so busy. We're rushing out to work. We miss lunch, or we, you know, have a glass of water, and then we come and have a big dinner when we go when we come home. I know certainly that's my day sometimes. But how can you develop during this time? In times of adversity, there are times of opportunity. So take this time, and health is not only your body. Okay. It's also the mind, a healthy body and a healthy mind. The definition of health includes mental health. So imagine being cooped up at home and having no one to talk to, no one to go, nowhere to go. People, two people have, hang, have attempted to hang themselves in the north today. You might hear more of this. May Allah protect us all from this. But people's mental health will deteriorate. As uh, a Muslims, we usually live in big families. You're going to be cooped up at home with other members of the family. It's important to speak courteously, address each other, maintaining a distance, maintaining good hygiene, because you don't want to spread it to your family. And call other people, call your family members elsewhere and try and maintain a community, a link, a network. Because that's the only way we're going to get through this. I can't stress to you how important it is to stay at home. Our uncles, our brothers are still going out to work. The government have said that they will... Provide, if you're self-employed, if you've been laid off, stay at home. Please, don't try and become a businessman at this time. Okay? It's about survival. It's about helping the society. Helping maintaining good health. 
can't stress to you how in London intensive care is full. So to put it to you bluntly, if in a couple of weeks one deteriorates, they are not going to get an intensive care bed. So don't end up in intensive care. Don't help yourself. The other, th the other thing I wanted to st stress to you is the health service is going to be under immense pressure. I.e., if you're going to call 999, ambulances won't come. If you call 999 now, if there's a genuine emergency, it might, it might be quicker than what's going to happen in two weeks. So, if you don't know a medical professional, make links, make networks, so you can get advice over the phone. If you call 111 and they're not picking up, and there's a genuine emergency, because people are still going to have their tummy pains, their appendixes, yeah? They're still going to have their heart attacks. The body doesn't stop. The world doesn't stop just because of coronavirus. People are still going to have their loose stools. Their urine infections. It's going to cause them to be confused. And people are going to be very, very, very in need of medical assistance. So the way to help the situation is by not putting pressure on it. But if there is in our community, with your loved ones, it's important that you take sensible steps. Don't panic. Now, I, 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 I probably will stress on that point. The vir there is no emergency in a pandemic. This virus, you don't need to be running around like a headless chicken because there's no emergency. It's here and it's here to stay for a while, as far as we know. So there's no point getting worked up about it. It's all about trying to maintain some decorum, trying to stay cool, and when things happen, do it as you would in any, any emergency. I, I very much wish you the best of health. Um, uh, other, other things I've wanted to quickly address in terms of um, um, the masjid and why it was closed and why some are remaining open and some are closing. Now, I'll give it to you <laughs> directly. If you're going to have 500 people who are, who are, some are unwell, some have COPD, heart attacks, diabetes, and let's mix them in with people who've got coronavirus. Because coronavirus, if you have coronavirus, you don't necessarily show symptoms for the first few days. You may do, but you may not. So if we were to have a congregational prayers in, in the mosque, Jama'at prayers, and have people who are asymptomatic with coronavirus and mix them in with elderly population, population who have other conditions. And it's a recipe for disaster. And in our religion, our religion is a way of life. It's here for human preservation. We're here to look after our health. Just in as in Ramadan, when one isn't well, one is not um, required to fast. There are other ways to um, engage in worship. Please, pray at home. This is probably a time to seek uh, Allah's pleasure, subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's pleasure, by reading about the Qur'an, reading about Islamic history, reading books, talking to each other. I think that's something that we've probably forgotten how to do. But I think my colleagues, I've not spoken to any doctors who are in disagreement with me to say that 
congregational prayers at this time is advised. They are saying close public establishments because it will be a source to spread the virus. And to put it in black and white, what are we doing? We are prostrating onto most likely carpet. And then when we make dua, we wipe it on our face. The virus can linger on surfaces for several days. So, you know, we don't want to dig our own grave. And if anyone has any questions about that, please, you can find me and speak to me directly. And that goes for anyone. Because I'm not here, I haven't come after work and it's 9pm for a joke. Because I've got to be at work tomorrow at 7am. And it's going to get worse. So, I, in conclusion and in summary, stay at home and stay at home and stay at home. Don't go out. You don't need that takeaway. You don't need to go to the shop. Let me just pop out. No, don't go. Stay at home. If there's anything I've said that's wrong, I hope Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives me. And uh, I wish you all the very best of health. Um, if, you, if anyone would like to get in touch, please speak to Maulana Jamaluddin and uh, he will make the appropriate arrangements. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'll pass it back. Dr. Mahmoud Rahman Chaudhary. I don't intend to take much time from the listeners. Just to bring it closer to home with regards to our Sheffield. This illness that Dr. Saab has mentioned and this virus is on the rise. میں آپ کو بتاؤں کہ یہ مسجد عمر کو بند کرنا جتنے حد تک اور جتنے مجھ سے ہو سکے میں نے اس کو روکے اور میں نے تاخیر کی کہ مسجد بند نہ ہو ورنہ تو حقیقت یہ ہے کہ مسجد کو ایک یا دو ہفتے پہلے ہمیں بند کر لینا چاہیے تھا بند ہم نے اس لیے کیا ہے کون چاہتا ہے کہ اللہ کے گھر کو ویران کر دے وہ بند ہو جائے کوئی بھی نہیں چاہتا ہے بلکہ آپ حضرات کو پتا ہے کہ روز جب موقع ملے ایک چیز کی طرف میں دعوت دیتا ہو مسجد میں آؤ جو من حضرات ہے مسجد میں آؤ مسجد میں آؤ مسجد میں آؤ تو اچانک میرے لیے یہ فیصلہ کرنا کہ آج سے مسجد عمر بند ہے کتنی بھاری ہوگی یہ بات لیکن جب یہ ڈاکٹروں کے ساتھ یہ ڈاکٹر محبوب چودھری صرف ایک ڈاکٹر ہے لیکن کئی ڈاکٹر کے ساتھ جب بات چیت ہوئی ہے ہر ایک نے کہا ہے کہ پلیز مسجد بند کرو مسجد بند کرو اور مجھے اور اس سے زیادہ دلیل پیش کرنے کی ضرورت نہیں ہے کہ اب ہم خود دیکھ رہے ہیں کہ مسجد بند ہوتے جا رہے ہیں بند ہوتے جا رہے ہیں ہو سکتا ہے کہ یہ اللہ کی طرف سے ایک رحمت ہو ہو سکتا ہے کہ اللہ کی طرف سے ایک عذاب کی شکل میں ہو ہمارے استاد شیخ الحدیث مفتینات اللہ صاحب حفظہ اللہ نے اپنے شیخ مولا مسیح اللہ خان صاحب رحمہ اللہ سے یہ بات سنی کہ جب اللہ تعالیٰ کوئی اس طرح کی بیماری آفت بھیجے تو کس طرح پتا چلے کہ یہ آفت اور بیماری یہ کسی کے حق میں رحمت ہے یا کسی کے حق میں عذاب ہے تو مولا مسیح اللہ خان صاحب رحمہ اللہ نے فرمایا 
کہ اگر ایسے موقع پر یہ بیماری یوں سمجھیے کرونا وائرس کی بیماری اس کی وجہ سے اگر کوئی بندہ اللہ تعالیٰ کے قریب ہو جائے تو ضرور یہ آفت اور یہ بیماری اور یہ امتحان اس کے لیے باعث رحمت ہے لیکن اگر یہ بیماری ہوتے ہوئے یہ بندہ عبرت حاصل نہ کرے اللہ تعالیٰ سے دوری اختیار کرے تو پھر یوں سمجھو کہ یہ بیماری اور آفت یہ اس کے حق میں ایک عذاب ہے اور شاید یہ بھی ہو سکتا ہے کہ دیکھو آج ہم مسجدوں کو دیکھتے ہیں یا مسجد عمر کے بارے میں یہ کہہ رہا ہوں جی بلاتے 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 لوگ آتے ہیں نہیں آتے ہیں دلچسپی نہیں ہے جی آج وہ فتنہ مچا رہے ہیں کہ مسجد کیوں بند ہے مسجد کیوں بند ہے اور اکثر وہی لوگ جو مسجد میں آتے ہی نہیں مسجد کیوں بند ہے مسجد شاید اس لیے بند ہے کہ میں اور آپ اس کو آباد نہیں رکھا ہے اس لیے شاید یہ ہمارے حق میں ایک عذاب ہو سکتا ہے اللہ کی طرف سے لیکن ہر نگیٹو سچویشن کو پوزیٹو نظر سے دیکھنا چاہیے اور جب ہر جگہ اب مسجد بند ہو رہی ہے یہ اب موضوع نہیں ہے کہ مسجد بند کرے یا بند نہ کرے جو مسجد بند ہو گیا اب اس سے ہمیں پوزیٹو نکالنی ہے عبرت حاصل کرنی ہے ہو سکتا ہے اللہ کی طرف سے یہ ایک رحمت ہو کہ مسجد بند ہے اب اپنے گھروں کو مسجد اور مدرسہ بناؤ جی اب تک ہمارے گھر کس طرح ہے سینما ہے جی فتنے کے وہ ہاٹ اسپاٹ ہے اور اتنے سالوں سے کیا اللہ کی رحمت ہمارے گھروں میں ہے اللہ کی برکت ہے کیا ہے اس میں قرآن کی تلاوت ہے ہمارے گھروں کے اندر ابھی بھی اس حادثے میں اور اس آفت میں کہ ہمارے ٹی وی وغیرہ بند ہے یا اس کو بھی ہم دیکھ رہے ہیں تو ہو سکتا ہے اللہ عالم کہ اللہ سبحان و تعالی نے یہ امتحان ہمارے سامنے رکھا ہے کہ اگر مسجد بند ہے تو اپنے گھروں کا اب مسجد مدرسہ بناؤ And this is my appeal to all brothers and sisters that we've gone beyond, as far as Masjid Omar is concerned, we've not gone past that stage whether it should be closed or not. Masjid Omar for the well-being and safety of our attendees has been closed. You have to understand that this virus, which cannot even be detected, can easily be caught and easily be spread. You don't have to be ill for you to have this virus or have a health condition. But what you and I are not realizing is that we're thinking we are fit, healthy, and we come to the masjid, let's say, for example, and if we have caught the virus, because let's face it, our community is such that we find it very difficult to abide by by instructions and I can tell you here that we've had precautionary measures in place for perhaps one or two weeks now but because we've got a habit of shaking each other's hand because unfortunately some of us have got a habit of sneezing into our hands not using the tissue the risks are enormously high and then let's say the young generation They've caught the symptoms and they might get away with it because of the immune system. But what if they carry these symptoms and they carry this coronavirus into their own homes where they were elderly people? And may Allah protect if that if them symptoms, the coronavirus now then transfers from this young person to this elderly person, there's very little chance of that elderly person surviving. Very little chance. So whilst I totally understand our Islamic history, the ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where he emphasized the importance of the masjid and the masajid, at the same time our deen is also about precaution. 
And the famous saying goes, al to khayrun min al-ilaj. Prevention is better than cure. And this is exactly what we're trying to adopt here. And the arguments, there's arguments on both sides. Khayrun nas man yanfa'un nas. The best of all people are those who benefit people. Now if for the sake of argument, we, the government's agenda now and the guidelines are that we should have social distancing. The masjid, unfortunately, is the complete opposite. We know the masjid is a place of unity, of universal brotherhood, where we get together, we know each other, we, and, and to, a, to an extent, we're socializing. So if we have to, if we caught the virus and then we pass it on to someone else, even our loved ones, the elderly ones, how have we acted upon this hadith, khayrun nas man yanfa'un nas? That the best of all people are those who benefit people. We have just been the cause of perhaps potentially someone's death. And my fear is for myself and from, from our community is that what are we waiting for? I don't want, as your Imam, to witness a death in our community. And Allah nakare that this was due to be why? Because we had a person who came into the masjid and he interacted and intermingled, and somehow he caught that illness and it passed it on to someone else. Then I know how our community reacts then. Then it becomes a big deal. For someone to die, for a loved one to die. Just the other day, Haji Tariq, who is our funeral director, was in a meeting with health professionals a few days ago. And one of the health professionals indicated there that after London, up in the north, Sheffield is one of the places with the highest cases, number of cases. And it's not even reached, like Dr. Saab said, it's not even reached the peak. We're two, three weeks behind. And that health professional said that there's a chance that the, the highest number or one of the highest number of deaths will be in Sheffield. So the importance of the masjid in its place, in its place, but this is a time now where we need to take the precautionary measures. Masjid ka darwaza band hai, khuda ke waaste bahana mat dhundo. Fitna mat machao yaha. Ji, abhi ummat ke liye ye baat zaruri hai ke hum ittihad, pyar, muhabbat, adab aur ehtaram ke saath rahe. Sabr aur tahammul ke saath rahe. We bear patience. We show understanding cooperation with one another. This is not a time to create fitna. The awam should leave the ikhtilaf and the masail and these issues of whether to close the masjid or not to the ulama. This is not the field of the awam. This is not the job of the awam. Leave it to the ulama and then Whatever your local alim, your local imam advises you, act upon that. Act upon that. Masjid Umar temporarily has been closed for no other reason except to safeguard the lives, the health and the well-being of our attendees, our community. So saying that, I want to share with you a few words of advice. In fact, I'll be honest with you, I want to read out to you an article which has been written by my beloved Sheikh, Sheikh al Hadi Hazamana Muhammad Sid Dorad Hafidahullah, entitled What to Do at the Time of Adversity. Before I read this very brief pamphlet, which contains seven points which a believer needs to adopt during any type of adversity in order to guarantee and ensure the divine 
mercy and help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Before I read this, and, and these seven points are such that you don't necessarily have to be in the masjid to act upon these seven points. In fact, wherever you are, wherever you are in the world, whether you're at home, you're in a masjid, you're in the bazaar, shopping center, wherever you are, you can act upon these seven points. And my plea and my request to all who are listening, especially those connected to Masjid Umar, I say this with a heavy heart, Wallahi, coming to the Masjid and then offering the further Salah with one or two authorized people. And I'll tell you, this is another fitna as well that people are creating in our community. If the masjid is closed, then why is there, why, why do we hear there's a few people reading the masjid, reading salah in the masjid? My dear brothers and sisters, very, very simple. Already, I feel and we feel and we should feel that the fact that masjids are closing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not allowing us to come into the masjid is a sign of indication that perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is naraz and upset with us. Is naraz and upset with us. Like everything, the house of Allah, the masjid also has haq as well. And it is only, only because of the haq of the masjid, the house of Allah. And in order to keep the ronak and the spiritual environment and the spiritual motivation going in the masjid, we are having few people offering the daily salah. I want to say a few people to be very specific. There's only three people, myself and two of the authorized people. That's it. Why? So at least, at least on the day of Qiyamah, the whole community, we can say as a community there, Ya Allah, even though your masjid was closed for the general public, even then the, the adhan, daily adhan was happening and the five daily salahs were taking place. There's nothing much more to it. And if I had the choice, knowing what's out there, knowing what's happening, knowing what is to come in two weeks' time, when this pandemic is going to potentially reach its peak, Wallahi, I don't say this lightly and, and this is not to undermine the importance of the masjid. I would rather prefer being at home. I would rather be pr prefer being at home and doing my ibadat there and turning towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But I have a sense of duty and responsibility. The madrasa is closed. The masjid is closed. Naturally, people are worried in a state of panic and anxiety, anxious and worried of the unknown. Questions are not being answered, a lot of misinformation going around. Therefore, as an imam, I felt it was my duty that I had to come to the masjid at least to perform the salat, to fulfill the haq of the masjid, and then get this opportunity on a daily basis to speak to you people to speak to the congregation and to try to offer some advice and some reassurance of what we are meant to do during these times of difficulty. So my plea and request to all the listeners, especially those in Sheffield connected to Masjid Umar and our madrasa is please during this time of difficulty, yes, of course, exercise patience and sabr, but transform your home into a masjid and madrasa. Transform it into a masjid and madrasa and get the whole family. This is the time to unite even within the homes as well. There's so much disunity, disunity in the home. This is an opportunity to unite. Every further salah comes, everyone should be awake. The adhan should be called in the home. The Fajr Salah should perform in congregation. Men at the front, women at the back. It's permissible, it's allowed. The Tilawat of the Quran should be a regular thing in the home. The Quran recitation has Shifa, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran himself. 
So these are things we should be doing. They read the Quran. Make the, make the home into a masjid environment. Every salah comes, you should fix just like we fix in the masjid. That this is the salah time for Fajr, Zohar, Asr, Maghrib, Isha. We give Azan 15 minutes before. We give Azan just before Maghrib Salah. And together we we'll offer, we'll offer our daily Salats. Together we we'll recite the Quran. We we'll increase different types of ibadat and worship in the home. With the Madrasa, I've already advised our Madrasa children that the Madrasa doesn't stop because the Madrasa is closed. The learning doesn't stop because the Madrasa is closed. <coughs> it's the responsibility not just of the Imam and the teachers, but you parents as well to create and develop a Madrasa environment in your own home. So it's flexible with the timing have it 5 till 7, 3 till 5, what, whichever time you choose, but there should be a prescribed time for our children to be learning their deen, just like they would do if the madrasa was open. <coughs> so make the masjid and make the home a masjid and madrasa. And whilst we are in this adversity, <coughs> I want to share with you the words of my beloved Sheikh, the advice of my beloved Sheikh Hafizahullah. And on this point, I will conclude. He mentions <coughs> in this little pamphlet what to do at the time of adversity. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Our world is full of turmoil. <coughs> Wherever we look, we find people undergoing difficulties, facing problems, fearing for their lives and that of their families. Many people follow the news and discuss the situations in their friend circles, but if asked about the contribution to improve these conditions, their answer would reveal no contribution based on the belief that a common person is incapable of bringing about change. In the apparent, it seems true that an individual is unable to resolve such big issues. But one must remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted his servants such tools through which they can alleviate any problem, big or small. <coughs> In regards, there are seven points detailed below which each and every person can act upon. Whether rich or poor, young or old, man or woman, or influential or non influential. <coughs> Through them, one can attract the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first point my Shaykh Hafizullah mentioned is Toba and Istighfar, repentance and seeking forgiveness. Each and every sin committed has a negative effect associated with it. These negative effects not only lead to failure in the hereafter, but also to problems and difficulties in this world. Allah mentioned in the glorious Quran, calamities have appeared on the land and the sea because of what the hands of people have earned. If a person was to sincerely repent and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness, then not only will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala erase the sins from his book of deeds, but will also remove the negative effects that these sins have caused in this world. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has mentioned Whoever holds fast to his dirafar, Allah creates a way out for him from every difficulty, grant him, grants him relief from every worry, and provides for him from sources he does not even imagine. 
This hadith in itself gives us the solution to this problem. That <coughs> through the blessings of Istighfar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will create a way out for us from every difficulty, including this coronavirus pandemic. And this panic shopping that everyone is doing, Allah subhanahu the Rasulullah subhanahu wa mentioned in this hadith that through istighfar Allah will provide for him sources of provision from which he can't even imagine. Second point, adopting taqwa obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After Tawbah and istighfar, a person needs to remain free from sin by holding fast to, fast to taqwa. Taqwa in brief means to carry out the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to refrain from those things which have been prohibited by him. If one does commit a sin, he should not allow any opportunity for the negative effects to appear. <coughs> Rather, he should immediately carry out Tawbah and once again tread the path of Taqwa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned whoever adopts Taqwa, he brings forth a way out for him and provides for him from where he did not even imagine. In another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Indeed, Allah is with those who adopt taqwa and carry out good deeds. In other words, at this moment of time, dear listeners, what we need to do is hold on to taqwa, carry out the do's of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the refrain from the don'ts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But out of human nature, if you were to err, then we should straight away turn to Tawbah istighfar. <coughs> the third point, dua, supplications. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the almighty all and all-knowing. Each and everything is in his control and nothing occurs without his knowledge or will. <coughs> he has the power to remove the greatest difficulty. Therefore, it is imperative that we turn towards him and ask for his help. There are endless examples which display the power and help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala towards his servants where he made the impossible possible. Where he made the impossible possible. It was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who rescued Sayyidina Yunus alayhi salatu was salam when he was swallowed by a fish. When Sayyidina Musa, Musa alayhi salam and the Banu Israel was, was struck at the shore of the Red Sea with Fir'aun and his army in pursuit, it was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who made the water collect on opposite sides like two mountains, leaving a dry path in between for them to cross. It was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who exchanged Sayyidina Ismail alayhi salatu was salam for a run just as Sayyidina Ibrahim was about to sacrifice him. It was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who granted 313 ill-equipped sahaba radiallahu anhu ajma'in victory over 1,000 well-equipped soldiers in Badr. It was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who liberated the Makkah al mukarrama at the hands of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the short span of eight years after migration. Hence, in times of distress and difficulty, want to supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most powerful, and ask for his help. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned, <coughs> supplicate to me and I will respond to you. He mentioned another verse, I respond to the call of God when he supplicates to me. If a person implements the first two points, Toba and Taqwa, and then makes dua, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will most definitely accept his dua and fulfill his needs. This is the greatest weapon granted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which each and every person can use in all circumstances to overcome any problem. This is why Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has stated that dua is the weapon of a believer. It is such a powerful weapon that not only does it remove existing problems, but it also prevents future difficulties from arising. <coughs> Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has mentioned in the hadith 
Indeed, dua benefits a person with regards to what has already befallen and with regards to what has not yet befallen. So hold fast, O servants of Allah, to dua. The fourth point, Muhammad Sheikh Tidullah mentioned is sadaqa charity. <coughs> sadaqa is an effective method of removing the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and acquiring his pleasure. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased, we will remain free of afflictions throughout our lives and we can hope for a peaceful and pleasant death. This is why Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has mentioned indeed sadaqa extinguishes the anger of the Rabb and prevents, prevents an ill, evil death. Sadaqa is similar to dua in that it, will, it also leads to existing problems being solved and prevents future problems from occurring. This is why Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has mentioned <coughs> treat your sick through sadaqa. Treat your sick through sadaqa. In another hadith he mentions hasten in giving sadaqa for tribulations cannot get past sadaqa. The fifth point mentioned is sabr and patience. At times of distress and difficulty, it is also very important to exercise patience. One should not become impatient and begin complaining about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and questioning his decree. Exercising patience shows submission to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which consequently leads to the uplifting of difficulties. In the glorious Qur'an, there is mention of when Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his companion, radiallahu anhu wa were going through difficult times. In such situations, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encouraged sabr. As mentioned in this verse, if you exercise patience and adopt taqwa, their conspiracy shall not harm you at all. Allah is encompassing of what they do. The sixth point is Salah. Although a believer should carry out all the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all times, Salah becomes even more important at times of distress and difficulty. Therefore, we should become punctual with our daily farad Salah and perform them according to the Sunnah method. Furthermore, any farad this Salah any further salah this previously should be performed. Along with the fard salah, one should aim to perform all the sunan and mu'akkada emphasized sunan, sunan and ghair mu'akkada not emphasized sunan, and nafal optional form of salah too. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned seek through seek help through patience and sabr. Ya yalla bin awan sta'inu bi sabri wa salah. Seek help through patience and salah. The seventh and final point my Shaykh Abdullah mentioned is the dhikr and remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are always in need of the help and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala attracts the help and mercy like a magnet. First, the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala attracts his attention. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the glorious Quran, فَذْكُرُونِي أَذْكُرُكُمْ so remember me, I will remember you. Once the attention of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is gained, the help of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes in abundance. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I am with my servant wherever he remembers me, and his lips move with my remembrance. Sahih al-Bukhari. Seven al-Qar come to mind, we should be recited abundantly during testing times. The first dhikr is La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu minal zalimeen which most of us know there is no deity but you, O Allah you are pure from all in imperfections indeed I was from amongst the wrongdoings, wrongdoers <coughs> when Sayyidina Yunus alayhi salatu was trapped in the stomach of the fish and had lost every possibility of survival he remembered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the above mentioned words which attracted his help. Another dua, Hasbun Allah wa ni'mal wakil. Allah is sufficient for us and he is the best one to entrust. This dhikr has also proven to be very effective in times of difficulty. 
It is what Sayyidina Ibrahim recited when being thrown into the fire and as a result Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prevented the fire from burning him. Also reciting Durood, Salat ala Nabi salutation upon Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam brings and attracts the help and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah Masakhawi rahimahullah has quoted a narration from Imam Ahmad rahimahullah. Rasulullah once asked, O oh Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how will it be if I dedicated all my time to confer durood upon you? Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied, in that case Allah shall take care of all your worries in this world and the hereafter. Therefore one should bring the recitation of durood in one's daily practices. There are many forms of durood, the shortest being sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the best being durood Ibrahim, which we tend to read in our salah. One may recite, one may recite any formula of durood, which one is accustomed to. One formula which is especially helpful at the time of adversity is Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin abdika wa rasuli wa salli ala al-mu'minina wal-mu'minat wal-muslimina wal-muslimat O oh Allah, send your special mercy upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who is your servant and your messenger and send your special mercy upon the believing men and women and Muslim men and women. In conclusion, Shaykh Hafidahullah mentions these seven points Toba, Taqwa, Dua, Sadaqa, Sabr, Salah, and the Dhikr of Allah are tasks which each and every one is able to carry out in every circumstance. Difference of gender, age, influence, health, and busy schedules are not preventing, are preventing factors in this matter. Individuals who carry out these points will experience peace and tranquility in individual lives. And if the Ummah collectively was to carry out these points, it will exercise peace and tranquility collectively. I urge all my dear readers and listeners in, my, in this case to endeavor to act upon these points and share them with others. So they may also practice and together bring a change in the difficult condition they are facing, inshallah. Ameen, thumma ameen. With these few words, I conclude. Ke ye do saat nasihate. Mere Shaykh Hafidahullah, Shaykh Al-Habib Hazar Mawana Muhammad Sayyidah Hafidahullah. Ne hum sab ko badlaya hai. Ye saat chizo par... ہم سب کو فکر کرنی ہے ان کو مضبوطی سے پکڑنا ہے عمل بھی کرنا ہے ان سات چیزوں کے ذریعے سے اللہ تعالیٰ ہمیں نجات دلائیں گے اس بیماری سے اور اس آفت سے اور یہ سات چیزیں ایسی ہے اور یہ سات عبادت ایسی ہے جو ہر شخص اپنے گھر میں رہ کر گھر میں بیٹھ کر بھی عمل کر سکتا ہے پوبار استغفار تقوا اختیار کرنا جو باتیں اللہ کے رسول صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم نے کہنے کے لیے حکم فرمایا ہے ان کو بجا لانا اور جو باتیں اور جو بات جن باتوں سے ہمیں پرہیز احتیاط کرنا ہے ان چیزوں سے احتیاط کرنا یہ ہے تقوا پھر دعا صبر کا صبر صلاح اور نماز اور ذکر اللہ اللہ تعالیٰ کا اللہ تعالیٰ کے ذکر اور اللہ تعالیٰ اللہ تعالیٰ کا ذکر اور اللہ کی یاد یہ سات چیزیں یہاں بھی مشرق عمر سے میں ہم تمام سامن اقلاق کے خدمت میں عدد کے ساتھ گزارش کرتا ہوں خاص طور پر جو متعلقین مشرق عمر سے ہے اور تعلق رکھتے ہیں کہ پلیز ان سات نصیحتوں پر ابھی سے عمل کرنا شروع کر دے اللہ تعالیٰ سے دعا ہے کہ اللہ تعالیٰ پوری امت کو اس آفت سے نجات فرمائے اللہ تعالیٰ اس مشکل مرحلے میں ہم سب کو ایک دوسرے کے ساتھ پیار محبت ادب و احترام کے ساتھ پیش آنے کی توفیق عطا فرمائے جو بیمار ہے اللہ تعالیٰ نے شفائے کاملہ عادلہ عطا فرمائے 
اور جب مرحوم دنیا سے بزرگ چلے گئے ہیں اللہ تعالیٰ کی ماں باپ اختر فرمائے میں اللہ سبحانہ و تعالیٰ گرانٹ از اول پروٹیکشن فرام ناٹ جسٹ دس ایڈورسٹی اینڈ کرونا وائرس بٹ اول فورمز آف ایڈورسٹیز انس اینڈ ڈیزیزیز ایٹ سچ ٹائم مائی ڈیئر لسنرز وی آئی کال اپن ایوری ون ٹو یو نائٹ آن دا دا بانا آف اللہ کے رسول صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم بائی ایکسرسائزنگ پیشنس بائی شوئنگ اے لو ہائی لیول آف پرسرویرنس اینڈ ٹالرنس بائی ہیلپنگ ون اندر میں اللہ سبحانہ و تعالیٰ گرانٹ آل دی اپرچونیٹی اینڈ دا توفیق ٹو ایکٹ اپن وٹ ہیز بین مینشن آمین ثم آمین واحد دعوا الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين